this is Sam of Historian Splaining, a historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, and other platforms. And if you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description. And this will be the next installment in my series, Doorways in Time, about the great archaeological discoveries of all time. My previous one was about the Library of Ashurbanipal, the largest trove of documents from the ancient world that's ever been found. And that one was posted on Patreon for patrons only. So if you want to hear it, please, again, go to my Patreon page and support at any level you can, even if it's just a dollar. But this today now will be the next in the series, Doorways in Time, The Great Archaeological Discoveries, number five, Gobekli Tepe. So this is a very special installment in this series about a very special and remarkable site. It's at once the oldest and the newest site that I have talked about so far in this series. It's the oldest in the sense that the structures that have been discovered at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey are the oldest monumental architecture that's ever been found in the world, and they predate any other site I've discussed by thousands of years. At the same time, it's the newest because it was the most recently discovered. Gobekli Tepe only began to be excavated in the 1990s. And we know that most of the site is still buried underground, yet to be excavated and examined. So there's a great deal of mystery around Gobekli Tepe. And since the year 2000, it has slowly gained greater and greater public attention and fascination. And it's often referred to as the oldest temple in the world or the oldest building even. But all sorts of claims about the site, including the very idea that it is a temple, have been heavily disputed and have touched off furious debate in the scholarly world and now also spilling over into popular literature and entertainment. And that may be where some of you have heard of it already. But before we get into the mysteries and the debates about Gobekli Tepe, let's discuss as simply as possible what is it, what do we actually know about it, and what is still uncertain or disputed, and to begin with, let's simply talk about where it is. So I mentioned that this site of Gebekli Tepe, which in the Turkish language originally simply means Potbelly Hill, is in southeastern Turkey, and specifically it's in an inland, fairly arid region called Şanlı Urfa, or for short, simply Urfa. And Urfa is a dry, rugged province of southeastern Turkey, where the Atlas Mountains and Garmush Mountains gradually slope down and eventually reach a low, flat, broad plain, sometimes called the Heron Plain, which is actually the beginning of the upper Euphrates Valley. And so hence, it's right at the upper edge, the northern edge of what can be called Mesopotamia. And Urfa is today the meeting place of three different distinct cultures. The hills and mountains of the province, the inhabitants are mostly Kurdish, an Indo-European minority group in southeastern Turkey, so Şanlı Urfa can be considered part of Kurdistan. There are also Turkish-speaking people scattered all through the region, and in the low-lying areas to the south, in that Heron Plain that I mentioned, there the inhabitants are largely Arabic, and Arabic is the main language. So it's actually borderland in the Middle East where three different ethno-linguistic groups that speak three completely different unrelated languages, a Turkic language, an Indo-European, and a Semitic language, all intermingle. And you can think of it as sort of an outer borderland of many empires and civilizations through the years, the Byzantines, the Ottomans, the Islamic Empire, kind of like you might think of the borderlands in Central Asia or the south southwestern United States. And Gobekli Tepe specifically is located close to the center of Urfa, about 10 miles east of the main town of Shanli Urfa. And it's located on the lower edge of their Germush mountain range, specifically on a southern spur or tip of a long rocky outcropping 
of mostly limestone that looks down and outward south onto the Heron Plain. So it's a prominent position right at the edge over these hillsides and cliffs going down to the Heron Plain. Now, how was it discovered that this was such a major archaeological site? Well, the process began with a rough scouting of Urfa at some point in the 1960s and 70s. So between 1963 and 72, a joint research and surveying team managed by the University of Chicago and the University of Istanbul sent out scouts to survey around southeastern Anatolia. And their findings were summarized in a book that was published several years later. One section of this book is simply called, quote, Surveying Work in Southeast Anatolia. And it was written by an American graduate student from U of Chicago named Peter Benedict. And Benedict included in this section short notes of various unexcavated sites with brief descriptions of the artifacts and particularly the pottery which had been found at these various sites, which could help to date them. And this short section includes a note on the hill called Gobekli Tepe, and it reads, quote, a complex of round-topped knolls of red earth with slight depressions between, located on a high limestone ridge trending southeast. The ridge is otherwise barren of soil. The overall diameter of knolls is 150 meters, and the rocky red soil rises to 20 meters above the limestone top. The ridge lies at the end of a steep-sided grassy gully, two and a half kilometers northeast of the village of Karaharabe. The ridgetop site and grassy west slopes are littered with flint artifacts. No water in the vicinity. End quote. Now, later on, Peter Benedict gives a brief catalog of finds that had been collected around Gobekli Tepe, and these included just five pottery shards, six pieces of obsidian, and 2,996 pieces of very good quality flint. So what might a reasonably well-informed, reasonably well-trained archaeologist make of this brief note and catalog of items from Gobekli Tepe that was published in the 1980s? Well, for one thing, they would take note of the piled-up earth on top of the rocky ridge, which Peter Benedict himself probably understood as a tell that this was a tell, a tell in the sense that it was a large, rounded mound often used for building or dwelling that had been built up over time by human action, whether just the accidental accumulation of debris or the intentional piling up of dirt and gravel, to create a high mounded hilltop or platform. And it seems that this is what Gobekli Tepe was. Secondly, they would also note the very striking disparity in the materials that were found. Thousands of flint pieces and almost no pottery. And this is very significant because flint technology is older. Flint is a stone that has been used to make tools, especially with sharpened edges, really since the dawn of humanity, even before the evolution of Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, were using flint as a useful stone for tools. Pottery, by comparison, is much more recent. It was invented at the earliest, maybe about 10,000 years ago, and mainly beginning in particular sites scattered around the world from which it then took a long time to gradually spread out and diffuse. So in most of the Middle East, pottery didn't come along until fairly close to the rise of civilization. It's much more recent. And so the fact that there is a huge concentration of flint artifacts and practically no pottery suggests that Gobekli Tepe's site was active a very very long time ago, at least in the Paleolithic era, the Old Stone Age, or the very early Neolithic in the period that's commonly called the pre-pottery Neolithic, those first few thousand years when people might have been first learning or experimenting with agriculture but didn't yet use pottery. And furthermore, it suggests that this site at Gobekli Tepe was for some reason abandoned and ceased to be used before pottery was introduced. So it's an extremely old site. Now, after 
Peter Benedict had made these observations in the 1960s or 70s. The site was then left untouched, except perhaps for some sheep herders and farmers plowing to grow fields of grain over the next 20 years. And Benedict also had observed two clusters of large stone slabs set into the ground, which he took to be cemeteries. And this was not unusual to find in Turkey and other parts of the Islamic world. People might have little remote cemetery sites where families or clans might have buried their dead with stone slabs. And hence, this indicated that excavation would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, because it would involve digging up graves. Now, meanwhile, in the 1980s, during this period of time when Gebekli Tepe was left uh, neglected, unexcavated, meanwhile, excavations were being undertaken at another site in Urfa, not far to the northwest, at a village called Nevali Chori. And this excavation was led by German archaeologists, particularly Harold Hauptmann. And most of the archaeology that has taken place in this whole area of Turkey, around all these important ancient sites, has been mostly German-led. And the reason for that goes back to the very long-standing partnership and alliance between Turkey and Germany, which actually goes back even to the Ottoman age. So back in the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was in a state of crisis. They wanted to reform and modernize. But most European powers were hostile to them, including Russia, France, and Britain, all of which had fought a war against the Ottomans in the Crimean War in the 1850s. So they weren't willing to send experts, administrators, to help the Ottoman Empire to modernize in this way. But Germany was sort of the odd man out. Germany was a new rising power in the late 1800s. It was a rival of Britain and Russia. And so Germany was willing to open up those lines of communication. And it led to a very close relationship in exchange of knowledge, personnel, technology, which then culminated even in the Ottomans participation in World War I, when they were an ally of Germany and Austria. And even after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the creation of the Republic of Turkey, this special close relationship has continued. And that's had a lot of ramifications because Germany was also the homeland of modern archaeology. And some of the first, arguably the first really big monumental headline-grabbing archaeological discovery of the modern era was Schliemann's discovery of the ruins of Troy, also in Turkey, which then helped to spur on this continuing German fascination with ancient sites in Turkey. And so this was then instantiated in the 1980s in this excavation at Nevali Chori, which, as I said, is just a bit to the northwest of Gobekli Tepe, and it needed to be excavated quickly because Turkey had plans to build a dam and reservoir which would flood that site. And so that gave a spur and an impetus to excavate. And the archaeologists found that Nivali Chori had many clusters of small rectangular buildings, probably houses, but then among them one very different building, one that was bigger, that was oblong, a sort of oblong rectangle, enclosing a smooth, sunken central floor space. The surrounding wall around this floor space had a, a ledge set into it, probably as a bench to sit on, and also set into the wall, interrupting the bench at intervals, were enormous stone pillars. So large megalithic stone pillars with lintels lying on top, creating a symmetrical T-shape, or in some cases, an asymmetrical gamma shape. Apart from these, there also were two large stone pillars set into the ground in the middle of the rectangular enclosure. And these pillars were in some spots decorated with relief sculptures of animals, as well as a few carvings of human arms and hands, suggesting that maybe these T-shaped pillars were supposed to represent human forms. Now, finally, in 1991, Nivali Chori was flooded. And one younger archaeologist who worked on that project named Klaus Schmidt, he was a fellow at Heidelberg University in Germany, and he suspected that there should be more sites 
around Urfa that could be similarly promising. And in 1994, he went on a sort of informal tour all around the noted and documented sites around Urfa that hadn't been excavated. And this included one trip along the edge of the southern foothills of the Garmush Mountains. And this is what happened during that trip, according to Schmidt's own words in a book that he later wrote. Quote, we walked through slopey, rather difficult and confusing terrain, littered with large basalt blocks. No traces of prehistoric people visible, no walls, pottery shards, stone tools. Doubts regarding the sense of this trip, like many before with the aim to survey prehistoric, in particular Stone Age sites, were growing slowly but inexorably. Back in the village, an old man had answered our questions whether there was a hill with chakmatashi, or flint, in the vicinity, with a surprisingly clear yes, and he had sent a boy to guide us to that place. We could drive only a small part of the way. At the edge of the basalt field, we had to start walking. Our small group was made up of a taxi driver from the town, our young guide, Michael Morsch, a colleague from Heidelberg, and myself. Finally, we reached a small hill at the border of the basalt field, offering a panoramic view of a wide horizon. Still no archaeological traces, just those of sheep and goat flocks brought here to graze. But we had finally reached the end of the basalt field. Now the barren limestone plateau lay in front of us. On the opposite hill, a large mound towered above the flat plateau, divided by depressions into several hilltops. Was that the mound we were looking for? The knocks of red soil Peter Benedict had described in his survey report, Gubekli Tepe? When we approached the flanks of the mound, the so far gray and bare limestone plateau suddenly began to glitter. A carpet of flint covered the bedrock and sparkled in the afternoon sun, not unlike a snow cover in the winter sun. But this spectacular sight was not only caused by nature, humans had assisted in staging it. We assured ourselves several times these were not flint nodules fragmented by the forces of nature, but flakes, blades, and fragments of cores, in short, artifacts. Other finds, in particular pottery, were absent. On the flanks of the mound, the density of flint became lower. We reached the first long stretched stone heaps, obviously accumulated here over decades by farmers clearing their fields. One of those heaps held a particularly large boulder. It was clearly worked and had a form that was easily recognizable. It was the T-shaped head of a pillar, like those of Navali Chori. End quote. So Schmidt and his compatriots examined, they found and examined these supposed cemeteries of large stone slabs set into the ground in the middle of the tell. But they recognized that these were not slabs, but rather the exposed tops of prehistoric megaliths. And they were arranged in curved configurations, reminiscent of Stonehenge. So the team began surveying, and they found small sculptures and carvings scattered around the tell. And they called this surface layer with these artifacts Layer 1. And then the further process of surveying was very slow, because the site could only be reached by foot or on horseback. And they began by digging a small trench. They found that the mound on top of the hilltop was mainly gravel, flakes, especially of flint and limestone, and pieces of bone, not natural earth. They also found stone walls arranged in a small rectangular pattern of rooms and buildings, rather like at Navali Chori. And based on the materials, and then later based on radiocarbon dating, as they were able to get results from the labs, they dated these structures to the period called PPNB. So that means the pre-pottery Neolithic period, which is believed to be contemporaneous with the very beginnings of agriculture, and hence the Neolithic age, before pottery. But B is the later phase, closer to the invention of pottery. So they dated these structures to PPNB, which is about, in that area, is about the 8000s and 7000s BC. And they take this layer near the surface with these rectangular rooms, and they call that layer 2.
So you have the scattered finds and the accumulation of flint on the surface on layer one, these rectangular rooms dating to PPNB in layer two. The following year in 1995, aircraft took aerial photos of the site. And in these photos, one could see a very clear and clearly delineated patch of reddish brown earth laid almost like a carpet over the rocky and craggy landscape spotted with white limestone. And this resolves for certain that this is clearly a man-made mound tell, not a natural feature. Also in that year in 1995, farmers who owned plots of land around the hill and who customarily farmed there came in to begin plowing. And one of them dug up a very large carved stone which he was then ready to smash into pieces and remove so that he would be able to plow and farm and sow a field. But the archaeologists were able to persuade him not to do that and to leave it in place. And they surmised that this large stone was the head of a T-shaped pillar, like the ones at Nivali Chori. And then the following year in 1996, they began seriously excavating the site around those pillar heads that they had found that either had looked like cemeteries or that had been uncovered by plowing farmers. And they began, as they dug several meters into the ground, they began to uncover a very large complex of several round enclosures with pillars set into stone walls that were laid out basically like the large special building at Navali Chori, but instead of rectangular, they were oval shaped. And they surmised that this deeper layer beneath layer two was earlier, and they called it naturally enough layer three. And after much painstaking gathering of samples and carbon dating, they dated layer three to the so-called PPNA and early PPNB. So basically the early and middle parts of that pre-pottery Neolithic period. In other words, the 9,000s and 8,000s BC. Hence, this site with these large stone pillars and enclosures was 6,000 years older than Stonehenge or the oldest of the Great Pyramids. And it was 2,000 years older even than Chatalhuyuk, which at that point was the oldest known farming village ever uncovered in the world. And the scale of this complex site was much greater than anyone had thought possible for so early in prehistory, for the pre-pottery Neolithic age, much less for PPNA, the earlier part of that era. And the discovery sent shockwaves through the world of archaeology, What was so extraordinary about it was not just the technological sophistication and the skills that would have taken to build such a complex and erect and dress these enormous megalithic stones, but also the level of social organization, the sort of work teams and the specialized laborers, builders, engineers that it would have required, which had always up to this point been thought impossible without the existence of large-scale farming, towns, and states, none of which, as far as they could tell at this point, had existed in this area in southeast Anatolia so early on in the pre-pottery Neolithic age. So as for what happened at the site and what was found in more detail, in the later 1990s, after 1996, there was a series of four more excavation campaigns led jointly by the Shanliurfa Museum in Turkey and the German Archaeological Institute, or DAI, which stands for Deutsches Archaeologisches Institut. And these projects of excavation were overseen by Klaus Schmidt, He sort of had that priority. He had a kind of finder's rights. So he oversaw and directed these excavations. But they went on slowly because they could really only work for a couple of months each in the spring and autumn seasons in periods of comparatively mild weather. So it really happened in fits and starts. But gradually they they were able to piece together findings and gain some understanding of what this site was or how it worked. So as for layer three, that deepest and oldest layer that has been found, it has a series of monumental enclosures with sunken floors varying from about 30 to 100 feet across. 
The floors in the center are either polished bedrock or paved with lime plaster. Four of these enclosures have been almost entirely or entirely unearthed, and those are labeled enclosures A, B, C, and D. There are then several others that have been at least partially excavated over the intervening years, E, F, G, H, and I. And these round enclosures, it seems, were created over the course of about a thousand years, from the late 9,000s through the early 8,000s BC. And furthermore, at least 16 more have been found using ground-penetrating radar around the rest of the tell, but those mostly have not even begun to be excavated. A few of these, it seems, are larger than A, B, C, and D, the ones that have been most thoroughly uncovered and examined. And some archaeologists theorize that they are, in fact, even older and set deeper into a deeper layer of the ground. In total, looking at these various enclosures, the ones that have been uncovered and those that remain buried, there are, it seems, a total of about 200 of these megalithic pillars. Most of them range in mass from about 2 to 10 metric tons, and around they tend to be around 18 feet in height, give or take a few feet. The largest that's been found seems as if it weighs about 50 tons. All of them were cut out of quarries just a few hundred feet from the hilltop on the surrounding slopes. They were cut and dressed using sharpened flint tools and sometimes smoothed down using sand and other abrasives. And this is clear the process can be reconstructed fairly well because one can still see several unfinished blocks still left in place in the quarries that were never fully cut out. Each of the oval enclosures has a fairly similar wall, a similar uh, oval-shaped outer wall with a bench set in, and these pillars set into that wall as well as two additional freestanding pillars set into sockets in the middle of the enclosure. It is still unknown and disputed whether or not these enclosures had a roof. Possibly there was a roof affixed to the central pillars, which might have been made of wood or thatch or hides or some sort of organic material that is now long gone and long decayed. The pillars are decorated with some fairly elaborate carvings. Some of them are simply abstract patterns that don't seem to represent any particular object, but many others are animals. That's the most common theme, including bulls, aurochs, foxes, snakes, gazelles, lions, donkeys, and spiders. There are also various different birds, especially including vultures and some others like cranes. And it seems that at the time when these structures were built, which would have been during or just after the so-called Younger Dryas cold period, the climate in Urfa was somewhat cooler and wetter, and hence there were rich grasslands, some forests, and a great deal of animal life, which then is seen reflected in the artwork. So the art is very extensive, and it offers a possible window into the beliefs of these people in the pre-pottery Neolithic age, right at the cusp or the very beginning of the agricultural revolution. If one looks more specifically at the particular enclosures, the first one to be excavated is the one called Enclosure A, and the two big pillars in the middle of Enclosure A have their capitals removed, but the carvings on the columns are especially rich, and they include latticework patterns made out of entwined snakes, which might represent or, or mimic a woven garment, maybe a garment or a loincloth of some sort made out of snake skins. And some of the pillars also have combined sequences of different animals, like, say, snake, hawk, crane, which might encode possibly stories. They might be mnemonics for myths, a sort of proto-writing system, or else maybe they might be totemic with each animal or each pillar representing a specific tribe or clan. That's the sort of thing one sees on the so-called totem poles from the Pacific Northwest. And furthermore, if one looks at the enclosures individually, there is a certain main animal that occurs most frequently 
in each enclosure. And in enclosure A, it is snakes, in B, foxes, in C, boars, and in D, birds. Now also there are a few here and there around the complex that have uh, engraved patterns of human arms and also a few have loincloths. And that seems to suggest that they maybe are intended to represent human forms without heads. And what does that mean? Could it mean possibly they represent deities or maybe worshipped or revered ancestors? Or maybe they're simply a motif sort of mimicking and representing the worshippers, the human worshippers who would have gathered in these enclosures. Now, over layer three, as I said, there's layer two, which seems to have been built over it over the next one or two thousand years. And this layer two has a series of abutting rectangular rooms, most of them roughly square. They are smaller than the oval enclosures, and they are stacked closer together. And they similarly have polished lime floors, and most of them have T-shaped pillars, like the ones in layer three, but smaller, only about six or seven feet tall. A few of them are carved with animals, such as lions. And they are dated mostly to the later 8000s BC. And overall, this layer, layer two, can be seen as pretty similar to Nivali Chori, which might also have been built in the later PPNB period. There are also similar patterns of construction and decoration found at other pre-pottery Neolithic sites around Urfa. So all in all, there are a total of 12 sites that have been uncovered so far in the province of Urfa that seem to follow similar patterns with these enclosures with benches and T-shaped pillars. And they include a large one at Karahan Tepe, which is possibly, according to some recent examination and analysis, might actually be older than Gobekli Tepe. And another one actually was just found at a site called Grey Filahuyuk in Diyarbakir, which is further east, outside of Urfa. So it's possible that sites with this basic style and design were repeated and recreated not just in Urfa, but in a wider swath of Turkey, above the, the upper end of Mesopotamia. So we have, as I said, layer three, then layer two with the rectangular enclosures. And then it seems around 8000 BC, the open enclosures, including all of the oval enclosures, were filled in with dirt and gravel, and the megaliths were entirely buried. And this gravel, gravelly fill was made of bits of limestone, as well as broken flint tools and vessels, and a great deal of broken up or ground up bones. These bones, some of them are human bones, but mostly they are animal, especially of cattle and gazelles. And this suggests that some of these bones might have been leftover debris from large meat feasts in which these large animals that had been hunted were then prepared and, and shared among feasting congregants. The human bones are mostly skulls, and some of these skull fragments show signs of cutting and drilling, suggesting that perhaps they were decorated and preserved and might have been placed around the enclosures or hung up somewhere as uh, sim symbols or decorations. And this suggests any number of things, possibly ancestor worship, or perhaps they were trophies from warfare or sacrifices. Then finally on top there is, as I said, layer one, which is a layer of dirt and ground stone that over the centuries has been repeatedly plowed for farming. And it seems as if this ceremonial site was abandoned at some point following the shift over from reliance on animals as a principal food source, or hunting at least, towards crop farming. And basically, the site has been exploited as a site for crop farming for several thousand years before it was then excavated. Okay, so those are some basic core facts that we know about the site of Gobekli Tepe. Then the question is, what does it all mean? What is this site? How and why was it built? And why does that matter so much? Why has it become a subject of furious debate in the fields of archaeology, anthropology, history, religion? Well, as I said, Klaus Schmidt oversaw 
these first excavations at the end of the 20th century. And he made a series of observations, or in some cases you could say assumptions, about this site and put forward an interpretation of what it was and why it was so important. So he pointed out that the site was far away from any good water source, like a river or springs. He argued that it had no clear signs of habitation. There were no apparent houses, no shelters with fireplaces or ovens or other signs of normal domestic activity, also no evidence of roofs. So hence, these enclosures would have been open and did not protect from the elements. But on the other hand, it was a remarkably lavish and complex site with very elaborate artwork and decoration. Enormous amounts of effort had been put into moving and shaping these megaliths, which weighed, as I said, up to as much as 50 tons. There was a complex structure with long benches and large columns, which, as I mentioned, resembled the so-called communal building or special building at Navali Chori. There was evidence of feasting, like large numbers of animal bones from large game animals, and also some brewing vessels probably used to produce beer, all of which suggested ceremonial, large ceremonial gatherings and feasts, but not ordinary everyday living. Furthermore, some materials found at the site, although the stone was clearly quarried right there at the hill, some materials like obsidian were not immediately local, but had clearly been mined and brought from far away, from several places, hundreds of miles away in Anatolia. And so based on these points and observations, Klaus Schmidt made an argument about the great significance of Gebekli Tepe, which had four basic elements or conclusions. One, the enclosures are ritual spaces or temples, not dwellings. Two, Gebekli Tepe was not a settlement. It was a special ceremonial site. Three, the site depended on a large, extensive network of hunter-gatherers who congregated there on special occasions and who supplied goods and labor to support the site. And four, the complex construction and ceremonies must have been overseen by a powerful religious elite that could command labor and cooperation. So Klaus Schmidt's interpretation of Gebekli Tepe has a massive significance for the rise of civilization. If true, it demonstrates several things. It throws into grave doubt the customary narrative of how civilization first came about, and even beyond that, it undermines our very notion of what civilization is. What do people have to do? What powers do they have to have in order for us to say that they have created a civilization? So what is this customary narrative that would have been broadly accepted as of the 1980s about what civilization is and where it came from? Well, the common normal understanding was basically the following. In the early Neolithic period, people invented agriculture. They started to plant and farm plants like grains, fruits, gourds, and then domesticated them into domesticated forms for better food production. Then from there, they invented other technologies like pottery in order to cook or preserve or store these foods. The agricultural revolution then allowed for the accumulation of large food surpluses, these large food supplies then supported town and city life and specialization of labor. As some people were freed up from the duty of food production, they could specialize in other things, such as art, writing, engineering, etc. And along with that necessarily went hand-in-hand -hand social hierarchy, some people assuming positions of authority to oversee and supervise these cooperative projects. And this whole packet of practices and technologies, agriculture, specialization, hierarchy, writing, building. This is what we call civilization. Well, Gebekli Tepe, if we take Klaus Schmidt's argument seriously, it seems to dramatically scramble this whole picture. The site, as he says, has no farming, and there is no accompanying town settlement. 
and it must have been built by hunter-gatherers who hunted and butchered these large animals like bulls and gazelles whose bones have been found at the site. And so it seems that these hunter-gatherer people must have had great technological and organizational sophistication that they were able to accumulate the necessary food supply in order to feed the workforce to build this kind of monumental site and the level of power, authority, and social hierarchy to manage and plan and carry out such a project. So this sort of paradigm shift has been summed up by some lay scholars and commentators. The writer Robert Adam Schneiker summed up in Skeptic Magazine, he laid out a basic summary of this paradigm shift that Gobekli Tepe seems to demand from a standard paradigm, which follows the rise of civilization through these steps. One, invent farming. Two, create a food surplus. Three, settle in communities. Four, develop a social hierarchy. And five, construct megalithic architecture. To then a new paradigm, where it seems as if, at least at this particular site, the process went more like this. One, gather wild grains. Two, create a food surplus. Three, settle in communities. Four, develop a social hierarchy. Five, construct megalithic architecture. Six, invent farming. So in this new view, farming is not the original basis for the creation of a civilization. Rather, it's a later product that maybe people attempted or experimented in as a way of creating a more steady, dependable food supply at a building site. So it may be that monumentalism, social hierarchy, all of this came about first, and then farming is just the sort of icing on the cake. Now, we should make clear this dramatic paradigm shift is, in fact, uh, you could say, in process right now in archaeology and anthropology, and it is not just due to Gubekli Tepe. As important and dramatic as this discovery is, it is actually just one weight on the scales, along with others, that have accumulated from the 1960s to today. So there have been, for example, studies of the behavior of modern hunter-gatherers and experiments showing the great abundance, surplus food, that can come from hunting and gathering. And that was famously summed up in Marshall Solins's book, The Original Affluent Society. There are also other archaeological sh sites showing large building projects undertaken by hunter-gatherers, some of them just temporary seasonal sites that were constructed and then dismantled or moved, and others that are more permanent, like the Moai on Easter Island, which were built by the Rapa Nui people, who were mostly surviving off of hunting, gathering, and fishing, with a little bit of gardening thrown in. There have also been studies and experiments showing that many massive projects don't actually take as much work as was previously assumed, and can be accomplished by relatively small clan or tribe groups. But I may go back to that later. Now, Schmidt's thesis was very significant in pushing for this total reevaluation of how we think of the rise of civilization and agriculture. But it only trickled out into the scholarly community and then to the public very slowly, bit by bit, from the 1990s up until the 2010s. And most of the original work examining this site and cataloging finds and analyses with precision were first written and published in German. And it took a long time for this work to be gradually translated into French and then into English and to then gain a wider audience, including eventually a public audience. And as it did so, as these arguments largely put forward by Schmidt and his colleagues sort of trickled out into the English and French speaking world, it led to a line of questioning and challenges. So many scholars did not, were not ready to sign on to Schmidt's conclusions. And there have been several distinct questions that have been raised about how we understand Gobekli Tepe and whether Schmidt is right. So one question, and possibly the most significant of them all, number one, is are we sure that it was not a dwelling place? And scholars, several scholars have pointed out 
It is true that if you go to this hilltop today, you don't see any rivers or ponds or springs anywhere close by, which would make it an extremely difficult place to live. However, in the era when these monuments were built, it seems almost certain that the climate was more wet, making it possible to collect rainwater in cisterns, and there are some flat-bottomed pits that have now been excavated around the site that seem as if they may be cisterns for rainwater. Also, if there was more rainfall, there simply may have been more springs that were active at that time that don't exist anymore, and so maybe it was possible for people to live there long term. Furthermore, the anthropologist E.B. Banning put forward a very impactful article in 2011 where he put forward various reasons to doubt the idea that this was uniquely a temple site and not a habitation. So for one thing, he sees a conceptual problem with drawing this strict line and dichotomy between homes and temples. And he argues that this distinction is based in a Western idea of a a strict separation between the sacred and the profane. And this sort of assumption really runs, I would say, all through anthropology. And as he points out, comes down largely from Durkheim, this idea that the, the bedrock of religion is the distinction between sacred and profane. But not all people around the world look at it that way. And certainly we don't know that people in the early Neolithic age thought of it that way. Many societies do not draw a clear line. And as for buildings, many homes might be the sites of mundane activities like cooking, eating, sleeping, sex, and so on. But they can also at the same time be considered sacred. They can have sacred boundaries. They can have holy objects or sites within the home, like, for example, the hearth. Many homes are often embellished with elaborate symbolic art with spiritual or cosmic meanings. And in the ancient Near East specifically, many homes involve decorations with horns and bones and what seem to be veneration of animals or preserved skulls or other body parts from revered ancestors. And many societies are fastidious about keeping homes ritually pure and will even destroy them if they become polluted. And Banning argues that you can see practices among indigenous Americans or the Ainu in Japan where they might burn or otherwise destroy a home that's been polluted, that that might be seen as similar or an echo of how these people, it seems, at Gobekli Tepe destroyed and buried these temples at some point in time. Nonetheless, even if we accept that there isn't a strict line separating homes from temples, that doesn't mean necessarily that these enclosures at Gobekli Tepe were inhabited. But Banning makes certain arguments, again, in favor of that. He argues that they probably did have roofs on them. The two central columns in the middle of each enclosure seem perfectly placed to support roof beams. And in fact, they may have been necessary in order to keep those central pillars stable. So as those tallest central pillars in enclosures A, B, C, and D have been uncovered, they've been found to be unstable and they've, the excavators have had to put up struts to support them and keep them upright. And so it only makes sense that when they were built, there must have been something else attached to those central pillars, keeping the whole structure in place. Also, a few columns, not most of them, but a few have been found to have grooves or holes near the top that could have been for roof beams. And if one looks into the filled debris that was used to fill in the enclosures, it has very little wood in it, but there are some fragments of wood and charcoal, and most of it has been found to come from species of trees that can grow very tall and are good for providing large, strong beams. And so all of this could be used to argue that at least there's a good chance that roofs were built to cover over these enclosures and hence that they could have been shelters and dwelling places. Furthermore, Banning argues that the enclosures are not totally unlike other houses that have been found at some other sites in southeast Turkey, mostly outside of Urfa, where one finds ancient roundhouses with sunken floors. So the same sort of design, just on a smaller scale. 
And finally, the filled debris also includes many bones and some seeds and objects like mortars that were probably used for processing food, like grinding grain. And hence, those can be taken as hints of domestic activity, like gathering, processing, and preparing food. So that is one line of questioning or dispute of Klaus Schmidt's thesis. A second question is, does the scale and sophistication of the site actually signify hierarchical organization or a powerful elite? So it is true that building this site clearly took a lot of work. It must have been a huge undertaking over many centuries, and it involved sophisticated skills. But the amount of work can be easily exaggerated. For example, it seems that a team of about a dozen people could move even the 50-ton pillars uphill, rolling on logs, using ropes, using lubricants like water or oil. It's not that much work for a fairly small team of people to move a megalith. And while it is difficult and it takes strength and exertion, nonetheless, it's a lot easier than moving the blue stones at Stonehenge over 100 miles, which we know that those Neolithic farmers in Britain did. Some of those stones at Stonehenge were brought all the way from Wales. So if that's possible, it's not so inconceivable that fairly small groups of people with Stone Age technology could have moved the pillars at Gebekli Tepe up one hillside. Furthermore, there's the larger conceptual and anthropological question of whether large complex projects can be undertaken by groups of people without powerful elites. And this actually seems more and more possible and is being discussed more and more in the scholarly field. And you may remember this is actually what David Graeber and David Wengro argued as one of their main points in their recent book, The Dawn of Everything, that you do not need a complex stratified hierarchy in order to undertake large projects or even build entire cities. And they actually twice cite Gebekli Tepe in two different passages as an example of this fact. Although one might say that arguably is a case of begging the question, since it is still in dispute exactly who built Gebekli Tepe and how. But other anthropologists have made an argument that the site could be seen as the product of interlocking social networks, not necessarily as a sort of pyramidal social structure or an authoritarian society, but of interlocking social networks around the wider region. And one Turkish anthropologist named Chigdem Ata Kuman argued in 2014 that Gubekli Tepe seems to fit in nicely with the various other sites that around the region that were gathering places for possibly local clan or kin networks. So sites like, say, Karahan Tepe and Nevali Chori were probably gathering places for clan or tribal groups around a local area where they could then hold ceremonies for trade, courtship, the finding of marriage partners, the sharing of knowledge, etc. And then Gebekli Tepe, if it is the largest and most monumental of these sites, then you could see it as sort of resting on top of the others as a sort of meta-gathering site for networks of networks all around the whole region. And you could see it as fitting in this way into a sort of fractal pattern of networks within networks. And hence, this might also account for its decline and eventual burial, which might have political roots that in the later PPN era, these local centers were sort of jealous of the greater centralization, the greater labor and wealth being put into Gubekli Tepe, and they tried to pull sort of power and resources back into their local sites, and hence Gubekli Tepe was eventually abandoned. Now, I would also add to that, onto Atakuman's argument, observations about the design. The earliest enclosures, which have been excavated from layer three, are round. And round sites tend to signify equality. You might think of 
Arthur and the Round Table. You might think of the, the Pantheon, the temple dedicated to all the gods. Uh, this roundness tends, I think, to represent uh, sort of equality of eminence. And there is notably, I would say, a lack of any thrones or big pedestals, which would seem to represent rulers and sort of central leading figures. And so from the design, I would say they seem more like gathering places of putative equals. Okay, and finally, a third line of questioning of Schmidt's thesis is, did they not have farming? So there are factors and pieces of evidence to consider here. For one thing, there's a lot of evidence of processing of grains like einkorn and tools for threshing and grinding. And one could assume that this was all simply from gathering from wild grains. But do we know that this was not in any way from farming or gardening? If this site was used so intensively and so much labor took place there for so many centuries, doesn't it only stand to reason that there, some experimentation may have gone on with simply planting food grains that were desired at the site? Furthermore, these grains from the later period of layer 3 in the late 8000s BC, they do show some morphological changes characteristic of domestication. So one can see things like bigger grains, weaker stems that tend to come into plant species as they are replanted and domesticated by farmers. And one does see these changes by the late 8000s BC, but those take a while right? They don't happen overnight. And it's unknown, it's unclear exactly how long it takes of farming and gardening for a plant to evolve into a domesticated form. But if that takes a long time, if that takes centuries or millennia, then it would suggest that some sort of farming was already happening long before that. And maybe in fact, goes back to the earlier years of the temple site. Furthermore, I would also add my own observation that a, it seems a transition to agriculture did take place. And as I said, by the time layer three and layer two are both abandoned and buried, the tell has now become a farming and plowing site. And perhaps that actually can account for the destruction and burial of the temples. It seems you could say to be a strange coincidence that as agriculture took over, so the enclosures were buried. Maybe this was part of a transition to farming and to a new form of society and civilization based on farming. Maybe the old gods and old ancestors that were associated with animals and the hunt had become obsolete. Or maybe also along with that, the space on top of the tell with this layer of earth had become too precious. There was a great demand and desire to use that ground surface for farming. And hence, initially, the temple complex was condensed, right? These large oval enclosures were replaced with smaller, tight-packed square ones. And then eventually, it was abandoned entirely and given over completely to farming. So these are all possibilities, but we can't know what the relationship between these events are, between the creation of the enclosures, the destruction of the enclosures, and the arrival of farming when we don't know when farming started. That is still the big wild card. So all of this remains ambiguous. Now, at the same time that Schmidt's thesis was trickling out into the wider non-German speaking scholarly world, likewise, it also began to catch the attention of the press and the public. So Schmidt published from the 1990s into the early 2000s. Schmidt published a series of brief newsletter reports and then journal articles reporting observations and findings from the site. And these were collected then in, and synthesized into a book published in German in 2006 titled Sie bauten die ersten Tempel, das rätselhafte Heiligtum der Steinzeitjäger or in English, roughly, the building of the first temple, the Stone Age Hunter's puzzling sanctuary. But it was not until several years later that parts of this book began to be translated out of German. And in the years 2000, basically 2008 to 2012, Schmidt's ideas spread and they began to be canonized as authoritative. 
And this happened for one thing in media articles of increasingly wider and more popular circulation outlets. And so they moved from specialized outlets initially, like Archaeology Magazine in 2008, which had a brief six-page article, to then Science Magazine, Smithsonian, and in 2010, Newsweek, which had a very long and effusive, you could say breathless, article about the enormous importance of the site. And in articles like the one in Newsweek, Gubekli Tepe is repeatedly called, quote, the world's first temple, or even as, quote, the zero point of history, right? So they're making very uh, extravagant claims that this is somehow the, the, the dawn, and, and words like this, beginning, dawn, earliest, most ancient, are used over and over again. And then further, Schmidt's thesis was canonized in chapters included in volumes, major volumes, on archaeology and prehistory such as the Oxford Handbook of Ancient Anatolia in 2011. So Gubekli Tepe is increasingly being slotted in in this very pivotal and privileged place in our understanding of the field and of the dawn of civilization. Now, Klaus Schmidt himself died in 2014, arguably right as this sort of wave of enthusiasm was cresting. And leadership of the excavations was then taken up by his widow, Chigdem Koksal Schmidt, who was a, a Turkish, is a Turkish archaeologist who was married to Klaus Schmidt. And she became not only the head excavator at the site, but also an advocate demanding from the Turkish government, which she was better able to do as as a Turkish-born citizen herself, demanding better protections of the site from the elements and from the climate. For example, she, she wrote a sort of outraged report after she saw social media images of snowfall on the sites. So there is a roof that has now been built over the exposed enclosures, but it is not a complete overarching roof. It is open on the sides, and hence rain and especially snow can drive into the site. So she's become sort of an advocate for further excavating and protecting and preserving the site. But further, after Schmidt's death, the debate that his arguments inspired has continued and carried on, and there's been a series of responses from what one might call the Schmidtian camp, from sort of colleagues and former students of Schmidt who tend to agree with his basic argument. And in particular, there was a series of articles in various magazines that came out in 2017, written by the archaeologists Jens Notroff and Oliver and Laura Dietrich, all of whom were in some way colleagues or disciples of Schmidt, and which tried to address and refute criticisms of Schmidt's theory. And they defended, most of all, the interpretation of the site as primarily or exclusively a ritual center. And they argued in these articles that some sort of devotion or cosmic belief would be necessary in order to motivate all of that extensive work. And they point not only to the enormity of the monuments, but also the evidence of large feasts, which left behind a great deal of bone debris, which they argue must have been sacrificial or ceremonial feasts, not just ordinary everyday life. They point to the very rich and ubiquitous artwork, Art is found on all kinds of surfaces all around Gobekli Tepe, including some of it on small freestanding tablets that seem to have had no practical function except as surfaces to bear these signs and symbols. So they argue that the art is not just embellishment like you might see in a home. It is a major purpose for which these enclosures were a vehicle. They also argue that the design of the enclosures is not similar to other houses from the PPN era. It's true that if you look far afield, you might find some that are round enclosures with sunken floors. But around nearer by in Urfa, this is not what houses looked like from the PPN era. Those houses tend to have internal walls separating living and work spaces. They are not big, open enclosures like you see at Gebekli Tepe. And rather, the design, they argue, is more like these special and unusual buildings, originally called in German Sondergebäude, that were, or special purpose buildings that were found at places like Navali Chori, 
They also point to the anthropomorphic motifs on the columns, representing enormous human-like figures, but usually headless and abstract. If you think of the T-shaped pillars, they're like a human with a body and shoulders, but the head is gone. And they argue that these figures likely represent deities or ancestors, and that is in keeping then with the finding of fragments of severed skulls in the fill debris, which suggest that either dead ancestors or sacrificial victims were decapitated and their heads kept as sort of artifacts or trophies, and that's echoed then in the sort of headless human figures of the pillars. And ultimately, in sum, they concede that it may be loading in too many Western cultural assumptions to call these enclosures temples. Perhaps that is unwarranted. But they argue instead for calling them sacred buildings or special purpose buildings, or if you want to simply go back to the original German, Sondergebäude. Now it happens that in recent years, if one goes back to the point of whether or not there was domestic habitation at Gobekli Tepe or not, that is still disputed, but recent excavations within the last six years have found a series of small, round enclosures with similar designs to the larger, famous enclosures, A, B, C, and D, spotted around the hilltop, and these ones do have hearths in them, which is a classic marker of domestic living. Now, what does one make of this? What does this mean? On the one hand, you could say, well, this supports the argument by E.B. Banning that Gobekli Tepe was a domestic village with homes. But on the other hand, one could ask, well, if these small enclosures do have hearths, why aren't there any in the bigger enclosures? There hasn't been any sign found of hearths or ovens, as I said. So why were the bigger ones different? Were they therefore not habitations, but somehow something different? Were they, could you say, larger mimicries of houses, but that actual people didn't live in? Were they perhaps houses built for spirits or gods or ancestors, unlike a real house? Or is it possible that maybe the evidence of hearths was cleared away when the temples were abandoned and buried? One could say, ultimately, it, the question is still left open. Even if we say, well, now there is good, strong evidence that some people did live at Gobekli Tepe. Nonetheless, what about the monumental enclosures? Were they homes? Were they temples? Were they some combination of both? Now, in addition to this debate that I've been describing between Schmidt's thesis and its critics, also other smaller lines of debate have sort of spun off and taken on lives of their own alongside that central debate. And one of these, perhaps the most interesting one, is the debate about the meaning and significance of the artwork around the enclosures. And one impactful article was put forward by anthropologists named Hodder and Meskel in 2011, where they argue that there are clear common themes uniting the artwork at Gobekli Tepe, which they argue is also similar to the motifs seen at later Stone Age farming sites like the enormous one at Chachalhoyuk, which I've mentioned before. So they say that like, like Chatalhoyuk, you can see certain common themes uniting the site at Gobekli Tepe. One, maleness and virility. All of the human and animal forms are clearly male, most of them with the penis and other male genitalia clearly visible. The only exception, so the only human form anywhere in the whole complex that's been found that represents a woman, is a comparatively crude carving made on a bench. So it's not on the monumental structures or pillars. It's on a flat bench that people likely would have been sitting on. And it's a, in a cruder style and might have just been graffiti. Further, they also point out that the pillars themselves have a phallic form with these long shafts supporting then broad heads on top. This sort of repeated male and phallic imagery 
really flies in the face of the long-standing stereotype about hunter-gatherers, that they were matriarchal, that they had a religion focusing on a mother goddess and fertility. Rather, the signs seem to point in the opposite direction at Gobekli Tepe, that these hunter-gatherers were interested in masculinity, virility, male power. So the second theme is fearsome and dangerous animals. Right? Animals are depicted much more richly and in greater detail than human forms, and nearly all of them are predators of one sort or another, like foxes, snakes, spiders, or if not predators, they are some other dangerous threatening animal like bulls. And in particular, the artwork shows an especially great emphasis and focus on the sharp, piercing parts of these animals, like teeth and fangs, which are often shown bared, claws, horns, and the beaks of birds like vultures, all of which are sharp body parts that can be used to pierce or tear into the flesh of prey. A third theme is the disarticulation or butchering of the body. So there are images of animals, especially birds, decapitating humans or tearing into their flesh. And this theme seems to echo the fact that severed and butchered heads have been found as part of the debris infill. So it maybe mimics some real ceremonial practice where people or bodies were decapitated. And secondly, it also mirrors what the humans at this site were likely doing to the animals, You're slaughtering them, butchering them, and eating them. Like there, you can see a sort of symmetry here, right, between human predators and animal predators. So if one combines these themes and motifs with the idea that the art in the temples probably records some sort of myths or stories, this suggests, they argue, it suggests that the enclosures were places that ritualized or memorialized the hunting and slaughter of animals, by which people challenged and defeated masculine, virile animals, overcame their power and their threat, and then butchered and distributed the meat of those animals to the people gathered there. So they argue that the processes of hunting, butchering, and distributing meat perhaps were just as important, or even more important, than the gathering of grains in the transition to agriculture. So they argue for a more meat-based rather than grain-based rise of civilization. Now, this whole argument that I've been describing by Hodder and Meskel was then challenged and questioned by another lay scholar named Donna Sutliff in the following year where she argued that this idea that the focus of the art is on dangerous and fearsome animals is dubious. She points out that there are very few bears or lions and no wolves at all in all of the artwork, which probably would have been the main most threatening predator to humans in that place. And the second most common animal depicted in the art is foxes which are technically predators, but they're not especially scary or dangerous animals to humans. And in addition to these things like foxes and snakes, which are very common, there are also some harmless water birds and birds like cranes. So she argues that this characterization of the art is mistaken. Furthermore, while the pillars are roughly phallic in shape, you can draw a connection there, that does not necessarily mean, then, that the pillars were understood as representing phalluses or penises. Rather, the association may have been the other way around, where the penis was seen as a sort of smaller example or symbol of some transcendent or cosmic element, right? Something that reaches upward, that rises towards the sky. So Sutliff argues that instead the enclosures are not about slaughter, hunting of dangerous animals. Rather, she argues that they are calendrical. The animals are associated with seasonal movements and behaviors, hence birds like cranes. Also, the high site on the hilltop over steep cliffs allows for a wide horizon and easy observation of the sky, especially towards the south. And the pillars, she argues, were intended to measure movements of the heavens, like an observatory, 
And finally, these elements in the art and in the debris, like horns, claws, talons, tusks, these may have been seen as special because they mimic the crescent moon, and hence can be associated with the heavens. So this whole argument is only speculative, but it can be taken overall as a reminder that the images and symbols that we see in this artwork are not necessarily literal. They may be in some way symbolic, allegorical, and they may be used to represent something astronomical or cosmic. And finally, the last line of speculation and debate that I'll discuss here, which maybe is the one that has reached the most people, is the popular speculation in the press and media. So the diffusion of this dramatic argument about Gebekli Tepe from Schmidt led to popular speculation and popular theories and books like Genesis of the Gods from 2014, which argues that the enclosures are temples dedicated to the Watchers, which are a very mysterious set of angels mentioned in the Book of Enoch and other prophetic books, and that are associated in that way with the city of Enoch, the legendary, supposed, super ancient lost city from before the flood that can be seen to symbolize or refer to the earliest origin of civilization. The popular pseudo-archaeologist and lay theorist Graham Hancock published a book called Magicians of the Gods. And this book argues that there was a lost ancient civilization at some point earlier than 11,000 BC, so before the beginning of the structures that we see from layer 3 at Gobekli Tepe. And that this very ancient lost civilization had all kinds of advanced technology long before mainstream science imagines that that was possible. And he argues that this civilization was wiped out by a series of comet impacts around 10,800 BC, which some archaeologists and other scientists believe may have happened, but it's an, it's an unconfirmed theory. And Hancock further argues that the survivors of this catastrophe then wandered around teaching the technology of their ancient lost civilization. And hence, these survivors oversaw the building of monuments like the pyramids in Egypt, Heliopolis in Lebanon, and so forth. And that all of these sites are actually far older than mainstream archaeologists have acknowledged. And Hancock's main basis for claiming the existence of this earlier civilization is that there were too many innovations that happened at Gobekli Tepe too fast to have happened naturally. And he says in his book, quote, The problem at Gobekli Tepe is the pristine, sudden appearance, like Athena springing full-grown and fully armed from the brow of Zeus, of what appears to be an already seasoned civilization so accomplished that it invents both agriculture and monumental architecture at the apparent moment of its birth. End quote. So the structure of Hancock's argument here is basically like that of Chariots of the Gods, this famous sort of pseudoscientific book, which made an argument for alien visits to Earth, that someone from outer space came to Earth and taught different human groups around the world the technologies that were necessary to build great monuments like the pyramids. And the, the argument is based on a disbelief that ancient peoples could have figured out major projects like this, the, the idea that it was beyond their capacities. And the argument offers to solve this problem in a sense by pushing it back to someone earlier, to saying, well, they must have gotten these skills and technologies from someone else who had them even earlier. Of course, it doesn't say then, well, where did they get it from, right? It just sort of pushes it further back into the mists of time. So it should be clear by now there are several problems with Hancock's argument. For one thing, we do not know that megalithic architecture and agriculture appeared suddenly together at once. Right? The traditional older paradigm would argue that agriculture must have been there first. The newer paradigm that's taking shape currently says the reverse, that people came together to do these massive building projects 
hunting and gathering was adequate to feed those workforces, and agriculture then only came along later as a result. And as I said, based on what we can see and what we know now, we cannot say when did agriculture begin in southeastern Anatolia. There's a range of thousands of years when that might have happened. So we do not have reason to think that megalithic building and agriculture both appeared suddenly and at the same time. We also do not know when exactly the building began. If we look at layer three in those famous round enclosures, A, B, C, and D, they date to the 9000s BC. So we can say that megalithic building was happening there at least that early. But that is just the earliest structure that has been excavated. We do not know when gathering or building at this hill actually started. And it may have been gradual and haphazard. We don't know that it sprung out of the head of Zeus all at once. There may have been many more stages and many more layers. It's possible that there also might be many other sites all around that whole region that could even predate Gobekli Tepe and could show earlier stages in the formation of this building technology and building style. And Gobekli Tepe may just be unusual in that these enclosures were buried under layers of earth and gravel, thus preserving them under the surface of the ground for thousands of years until Schmidt came along to excavate them. And recently, some archaeologists have further argued that it may be that there were earlier stages in the development of this building system that were in wood before they then started using stone. So there's just a whole lot of history there that we just don't know yet. We don't know that Gobekli Tepe somehow flashes into existence at this one moment in time. It's just that that's what we've found so far. So hence it's wrong more broadly beyond Hancock's argument. It's wrong and premature to call Gobekli Tepe the world's first temple or the zero point of history. There may be many more layers yet to be found and to be excavated. And on a conceptual level, it may be impossible to draw some sharp boundary line between temples and other buildings. We don't know how different structures and their different uses evolved over the millennia. But to go back to Hancock, his argument is not really supported in the evidence, right? Technologically, we don't know when agriculture came about. Hunting and gathering, we now know, does allow for large surpluses and for sophisticated social organization and sophisticated projects. And we can see from examples like Easter Island, knowledge of stone, understanding of different kinds of stone and how to manipulate them, can be enough for very complex building and engineering. And conceptually, when we look at Gobekli Tepe, it certainly represents a very important newly discovered stage of human advancement. But there are many more that may be out there to uncover and to understand. And there's no necessary reason to think that there was some massively advanced civilization somewhere else that then brought technology to Gobekli Tepe. But nonetheless, all of that being said, his book, Magicians of the Gods, may still have a great value in arguing for the possibility of an earlier sophisticated society or civilization. There, indeed, he may actually be right, and it's a worthwhile question to ask, is there a civilization with sophisticated organization and technology stretching back into the Ice Age or even earlier? How could we disprove that, right? It's a difficult, it's an almost impossible negative to disprove, but the discovery of Gobekli Tepe suggests there might be real concrete evidence out there still to be found if we look for it. And also it has value, the book has value in helping to bring this important site out of obscurity and into popular consciousness, where it inspires wonder and speculation. And even if those speculations are turn out to be wrong, and even if a lot of them are poorly founded, they still can push forward and advance knowledge of the world. So thank you so much for listening. Again, if you want to hear all of the patron-only materials, including the previous installment about the library of Ashurbanipal, please go to my Patreon page. The link should be in the description. Thank you.